Uh, awesome. Thank you, gentlemen. I want to start off by saying thank every single one of you for taking the time and effort to come today. You didn't have to come, and you chose to come. So in saying that, let this be a day, as even Pastor Eric shared, where your hearts are changed, your minds are renewed, your souls are restored. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. There's a huge mega church, 20,000 people. It's packed to the hilt. And all of a sudden, they're waiting for the pastor to come out on the platform. Instead, the devil comes out. <laughs> Literally, everybody in the church runs out of the church completely, just runs out the doors. And there's one elderly gentleman that stays sitting in the front row. The devil looks at this elderly gentleman and goes, why did you not leave? Are you not afraid of me? He goes, absolutely not. Amen. I've been married to your sister for 50 years. <laughs> A merry heart as good as a medicine. <laughs> Got to have a little fun in life. But actually, in all honesty, because of the power we have in Jesus Christ, we don't need to be afraid of the enemy. Amen. We really don't. I got to tell you something. I'm going to always share from my heart because of what God is showing me and teaching me in my own life and what I'm going through. I think the biggest thing that I've been experiencing over these months is this. We have too many people in the body of Christ sitting in pews that are truly not whole and not well. There were 10 lepers, 10 lepers that Jesus healed. Only one returned. Amen. Every one of them were healed, but one returned. And the words that Jesus said to the one that returned was, you are now made whole. Amen. You are made whole. I believe much of the body of Christ, and I speak to myself before anybody else, we're not walking in the fullness of who we are. We have preached from the pulpit for way too long, nothing but fire insurance. We get people saved, don't get me wrong, we've got to get them saved. And then we just leave them there. Amen. And we don't see lives healed. We don't Amen. see souls restored. Amen. We don't see Amen. minds renewed. And we don't see hearts that are healed. Because our whole goal is we just want to get them saved. And we miss out on the fullness of the kingdom of God that's inside of every one of us. And that is the power of the Holy Spirit. You matter to God so much that he gave his son on your behalf. God would not send his son to die for junk. Otherwise, the crucifixion is a three-ring circus and the biggest joke ever perpetrated upon the human race. That's how amazing the crucifixion is because of your value, your worth in the sight of God. You matter to God. And then a step further, you matter so much to God that when Jesus left this earth, he basically said to his disciples, the only way you can be like me, imagine this, they're hanging out with him for three and a half years, okay, he's talking about his kingdom coming, talking about all this type of stuff happening, and all of a sudden the disciples are confused, seriously, because he's crucified, mm -hmm. he's killed, they think he's done. Three days later, they get him back. Could you imagine the excitement after having spent three and a half years with him thinking he's done, he's gone, he's finished, he's out of this place. But no, wait a minute. He comes back. He's talked about his resurrection. He's back. He spends approximately 40 more days with them. And then he says to them, sorry, fellas, i got to get out of here again. But now I'm going to be gone basically for good in a physical form. But it's vital that I leave. Because if I don't leave, all the things that I have shown you, all the things you have seen me do, all the things that I'm encouraging you to live by, you will not have the ability to do those things if I don't leave because I can't send the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, who will remind you of every single thing that I have taught you and I have shown you. Here's the biggest issue, and I know Pastor Hodges is going to preach some on this later, and I always come back to this. You can read your Bible as much as you want to read it. But unless you are empowered by the Holy Spirit to understand it and the Holy Spirit to empower you to live it out, you're wasting your time. Do not even read it. Don't even spend time in it. Because the Holy Spirit is the one that will empower you to live the life you can live. Amen. So I see too many times in churches of America that men get frustrated because they're told all these do's and don'ts to try to follow. And don't get me wrong. Reading the Bible is vital. Mm -hmm. Praying is vital. But unless I have the Holy Spirit empowering me to do that, 
I'm not going to live the life that God has called me to live and be. It's really that simple. So you have the Holy Spirit that wants to empower you. Let me make this real clear. The enemy is about wounding and hurting us. <clears throat> Satan has two major titles. He's the father of lies and he's the author of confusion. Right. His number one goal is to lie to you. To get all into your mess, get all into your business, get all into your life and tell you you don't measure up. You're not good enough. You can't. You know the difference, and i got to repeat this. I've said this at one of the other venues, and I know we have a lot of new people in here. So there might be a few similar things I'm going to share today because I know we have some people that haven't been to this event before. But it's real simple, okay? The enemy wants to tell you you don't matter, you don't count, you don't fit in, and it's all about the work that you do. No, the greatest faith you can ever have is in faith of what Jesus Christ has done for you and the place and the position that he has put you in at the right hand of the Father. Jesus became you on the cross so you can become him literally sitting next to the right hand of the Father. You are the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. You are holy, you are blameless, you are spotless. All because of what Jesus Christ has done. Not because of your work. Amen. Not because of your work. Not because of my work. But we miss out on that. So the enemy's number one goal that he works at doing in every one of our lives is to wound us and to break our heart. Jesus said that I've come to heal the broken heart of the set the captive free. If he can break your heart, then guess what? It becomes an entry point for the enemy to get in and deal with your issues and deal with things in life. Let me say this clearly. You are a spirit that lives in a body that has a soul. Okay? Your soul is made up of your mind, your will, and your emotions. The enemy's greatest goal is to keep your soul confused, keep your soul in detriment, keep your soul filled with anxiety and worry and fear. Because if you can keep your mind, your will, and your emotions all caught up in that, then guess what? You don't live out the life that God has completely called you to live out and do the things that you can do. And we buy into lies that the enemy tries to feed us. I was sharing with one brother before. The enemy's greatest goal is disunity. And he shared how he loves my brother Richard. I love coming to these different churches to run into different brothers and be part of the body of Christ. Amen. I share this and I share this with Richard. I said, anytime anybody in the world deals with <clears throat> racism, or prejudice. Do you know what they have just said to God? God, you mess up. Everybody's supposed to look like me, talk like me, speak like me, act like me. If everybody did, this world would be a disaster. <laughs> God, no, let me tell you something. I travel all over the nation. Hear me carefully. I love all kinds of food. Trust me, I eat my way through the nation. That's why this is called the mark of the feast right here. Okay? I have never been a meal that I don't love. I'm the first on the buffet line. I am the last one to leave, just so you know that. But here's the thing. I go to Birmingham, Alabama to speak. I am an Italian man. I'm also a Swedish man, so I'm a Swedish meatball, so you know that. <laughs> but I'm an Italian man from New York. I love Italian food. When I go to Birmingham, Alabama, do not take me to an Italian restaurant. I do not want Italian food in Birmingham, Alabama. I want deep south southern home cooking. That's what I want. Why? Because there is an unbelievable authenticity and amazement to the type of food that I am going to get from the culture that may be part of Birmingham, Alabama. Do you understand what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah. Because God knows that each and every one of us brings something special to the table. Mm -hmm. But the sad reality in this world is too many people think they don't matter, they don't count, because something has happened in this world. And here's the enemy's greatest goal is to break our heart and wound us. And so many people think the pain becomes the major issue. The pain is not the major issue. It's the message in the pain that becomes the major issue. Because the message in the pain that the enemy perpetrates on us tells us that we're not good enough, we can't, and we don't measure up. We don't matter. We don't matter to God, we don't matter to people, we don't matter to church, we don't matter to anybody else. That's the enemy's greatest goal, is to let us know that we don't matter. God's greatest goal is to let you know that you do matter, and you matter so much to him. And i got to tell you, Glenn Shavers is the one who orchestrated this whole becoming God's man. When he and I met about a year and a half ago, two years ago, and to see these conferences absolutely work out. Thank you so much, Sam. To see these conferences happen, because to Glenn, he wanted every man to know you matter to God. 
You matter to me, but you matter to God first. And I want to put on these conferences so you can know how much you matter to God, how loved you are, how adored you are, and how valuable you are. Amen. But gentlemen, even in sometimes the way I pray, I'm learning every day. That we use words as believers. Turn it over. Resist the enemy. Give no place to the enemy. Absolutely. Read my Bible. Love others like Christ has loved the church. Love my wife as Christ has loved the church. Be kind to my enemies. Forgive those who have done wrong to me. Mm -hmm. Okay, wonderful. But guess what? Let's make this clear. You cannot, you will not, and do not have the ability to do any of those things without the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Your humanness and flesh does not want to do it. So you heard the title of the message is You Matter, It Doesn't. The it is simple. Where you have been wounded and hurt in life, where you have been broken in life, and where you truly have not dealt with the issue of forgiveness in your life. Let me make it clear for you. God wants to heal your broken heart so you have the ability to forgive. Yeah. And if you do not forgive, it's simple. Yeah. Unforgiveness has a great fallout in your life. It wreaks havoc. It's like I spent time in the Midwest and I saw the detriment of tornadoes. Tornadoes rip through cornfields. They rip through neighborhoods and they tear everything up in its sight. Every single man in this room that has been wounded and hurt you were wounded and hurt in life because the person who wounded and hurt you never dealt with forgiveness issues in their life, so therefore they perpetrated stuff upon you. And then when you don't deal with forgiveness issues and find the fullness of forgiveness in your life, then guess what? You and I perpetrate pain upon other people. We keep that cycle going. That's the enemy's greatest goal. That's why Christ talked so valuable about the issue of forgiveness. That basically if you are not willing to forgive your brother who has a splinter in your eye when you literally have a log in your own eye, you're hurting yourself. You're hurting nobody else but yourself. And then he goes on to tell you to bless those. Bless those. Can you imagine blessing those people who have really done wrong to you? All right. Let me tell you something. Some of you don't know my testimony. I'll share it quickly. I tragically lost my wife when a drunk driver crashed through my house 30 years ago, killed her and some other two mates, and married her alive. I was on a run over completely by a full-size F-150 Ford pickup truck. And I knew the vital aspect of walking in forgiveness and choosing to forgive. But I knew from the start that I would not be able to forgive without the power of the Holy Spirit. And still in my life, every time I yield to the flesh, the flesh is about one person, I and me. That's it. I don't care about, as, as the expression is, I don't give a rat's behind about nobody else but myself when I operate in the flesh. I don't care about you. There was a song that came out, what have you done for me lately? That's literally what the flesh is all about. What have you done for me? What do you do for me? How could I use you to bring the best effort to my life? Because I don't give a rat's butt about you. I'm all about myself. That's what the flesh says. And the moment I walk into the flesh, I start going down that path, and then all of a sudden it wreaks havoc. And then all of a sudden somebody does wrong to me. I'm done with you. I'm throwing you under the bus. I'm kicking you to the curb. You know, I believe most believers are not truly set free and whole. Is this number one thing. I believe too many believers are afraid, or as we say in Brooklyn, New York, are scared. <laughs> to come out and tell somebody what they're truly battling with and dealing with. Because they are so afraid of being thrown under the bus, yeah. about being judged, about being condemned, about, oh, look at you, Mr. Jesus man, Mr. Tongue Talker, and this is what you do, and this is how you act, and this is, absolutely. You ever hear this expression, I can't believe he did that or said that, and he's supposed to be a believer. I can believe it. He's a human being, and the moment he gives into the flesh, he's going to do things that are not the best for his life or the best for other people. That starts with me first. It's really that simple. And that's the enemy's greatest goal. Well, that's why people are afraid to come out and share their hearts. You know what Galatians 6 says? Galatians 6 says, do not basically judge other people for what they've done, but basically when you see a brother or a sister in need or that has fallen short, you as a believer, as a brother or a sister in Christ, have the responsibility of restoring them back to the place that God created them to be. But that doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. 
Because people are so afraid of sharing something because they are so afraid of being judged and thrown under the bus. So therefore, they'd rather say nothing so they never truly get whole and well. And their soul, which is their mind, their will, and emotions, still have those wounds in there. And then all of a sudden, out of those wounds, remember when Jesus was approached any time by demon-possessed people who came in the presence of them, they would say one of two things. One, have you come to persecute us before our time? Or number two, we find nothing in common with you. They found nothing in common with him because Jesus at that point had never been wounded yet. He wasn't wounded till he went to the cross. That's why he was wounded for our transgressions. Gentlemen, you and I fall short. We sin when we operate out of our wound. Because our wound tells us we don't matter. The Spirit of God tells us we do matter. And when we operate out of that wound and operate out of the flesh, and we're told that we don't matter, then we're running to anyone or anything for the moment to numb that pain and to quiet the voice that tells us we don't matter. And we don't count in God's eyes. And God's ready to slap us silly because of the wrong that we have done. When Jesus hung on the cross and said the words, it is finished. He didn't look at you, Reggie, and say, I've got to tell you straight up, Reggie. For you, it's not quite totally finished. I'm only going to give you 70% of it is finished. The other 30%, you've got to work out on your own, my man. You've got to deal with it yourself. You've got to make it happen on your own because that stuff's a little too intense, and my blood can't cover that stuff. No, my blood covers everything. My blood completely covers everything. And the reality of it is, it's the blood of Jesus Christ that washes away every single thing that I have done, I am doing, or that I will do. Okay? That's what does it. Not me. God is the only one who can do that. But the greatest point of me doing that is through the power of forgiveness and the willingness to let that go and to even bless those who have hurt me, who have done wrong to me. To bless those, to pray for those who have despitefully used me. You want to be healed of your forgiveness? Unforgiveness, excuse me. You want to be set free? Then the reality is letting go of those who have done wrong to you. And asking the Spirit of God to give you the strength to heal you. Because God's created us to have what I call a radiant heart. A radiant heart is a heart that radiates all the love, the joy, the goodness, the peace, the compassion, the forgiveness, the understanding, the kindness of God. Mm -hmm. The enemy can break that heart. And since that heart is broken, it doesn't walk in the fullness of the spirit that the spirit has for that heart to be. And to be that radiant heart. And to exemplify his great love for all of us. So those it's in life, those places we've been wounded, those codependencies we have run to, the only reason why people run to a codependency, they're not abusing drugs or alcohol or verbally, physically, or sexually abusing anybody else, or, or getting caught up in pornography or whatever the thing may be. They don't do that because they got nothing better to do. We get caught up in those things for one simple reason. The enemy keeps on screaming out, you don't matter, you don't count, you don't fit in, God doesn't love you, you're worthless, you're whatever other name the enemy wants to use to call you. And God's desperately saying that you do matter. You do count. You do have amazing and great value. And through the power of forgiveness, the Holy Spirit will do things in your life. The Holy Spirit is always about leading us into truth, righteousness, and understanding. I am continually blown away at how the Holy Spirit is always leading me a certain way. And listen to me when the Holy Spirit talks to you. And we use the phrase obedience. The obedience aspect He's not saying, well, if you don't obey me, I'm going to beat the living daylights out of you for not obeying me. No, God is saying, here's the best I have for you. If you choose not to obey where I'm leading you and you go another direction, I will still love you, I am still with you, but the best is not going to be for you in that situation, and there's going to be consequences that come with that. Yes. Let me give you a simple example of what happened to me recently. I'm laying in bed, I'm getting ready, well, I'm actually sitting in my room praying, and somewhere around 1.30, I'm about to get up and leave and go run some errands. i got to go to the cleaners first. The Spirit speaks to me. Why don't you hang out just a little longer and pray just a little more? Okay? Be a little more still and quiet. So I do it. I spend a little more time. I finally get up and I go. And I make my first stop. I live near the Treasure Island area of St. Petersburg is where I live. I'm going up central. And I'm going to stop in the cleaners, and I'm going to pick up my cleaning, and I walk in, and it's somewhere around 2 p.m. 
And the woman I start to talk to, just a wonderful woman, her name is Pat, and I'm talking to her a little bit, and I pay for my cleaning, and I grab my clothes, and as I start to walk out of the cleaners, the Spirit speaks to me. I'm saying goodbye to her, but the Spirit speaks to me and says, I need you to go pray for that woman. I'm like, really, God? Come on, I'm leaving. I've got other errands to run. I don't feel like going back to pray for her. As I'm hanging my clothes up in the car again, go pray for her. I come back in. I obey the Spirit. I come back in. And I say, Pat, you know, I hope this is not weird to you, but I really feel led to pray with you. She goes, oh, my God, you have no idea how much I can use in prayer. So I pray for her. She starts crying. She starts telling me about her son and some of the struggles her son is going through. And thank you for praying for her and her son. And she's just rejoicing over the moment that I took to pray with her. I'm finishing up my prayer. And just as I'm finishing up my prayer for her, the door opens and another elderly gentleman walks in. And I turn, as I'm praying with her, I'm finishing up, I turn and look at him. He's got the biggest smile on his face. Because as he walked in, he could see I was praying with her. Well, he's got this Jesus shirt on. And on this Jesus shirt, he's, his whole shirt says something about Nike was not the one who invented Just Do It. Jesus was the one who invented Just Do It. So all of a sudden, we start having this little conversation. And he was all excited. So me and Pat ended up praying for him. And all of a sudden, he looks at me and goes, if you mind me asking, what is your name? I tell him my name. For those who don't know me, my uncle Rico Petroselli played for the Boston Red Sox for 15 years. So I grew up in New York City. I was a Red Sox fan. Let me tell you how unbelievable God is what is about to happen. Uh, it is a miracle I live, I promise. Yeah, that's right. Like I said, my best friend in high school, his name was Bruno. You think he's about 6'5", 250. Bruno was 5'9", 100 pounds. But he was a diehard Yankee fan. I was a Red Sox fan. So anyway, I always followed the Red Sox. Loved my uncle Rico. Tried to follow in his footsteps. And all of a sudden, he asked me, this guy's name, which was ironic, the woman behind the counter's name was Pat. His name was Pat. And he asked me, he goes, so what's your name? I go, well, my name is Bobby Petroselli. He has the biggest smile. He says, you know, Bobby Petroselli, I have been wanting to meet you for years. I'm like, huh? He goes, let me really cut to the chase. I am best friends with your Uncle Rico. And when I was part of the baseball chapel in the early 1970s, God used me to bring your Uncle Rico to Jesus Christ and accept him as Lord and wow. Savior. Are you, excuse the expression, flipping kidding me? Right here is Pat, the man my Uncle Rico would talk about for years, had no idea he lived in Florida, but because the Spirit of God asked me to wait a couple moments longer to go out shopping, I would have never run into him and have had no idea. And in the last three weeks, with some of my own things that I've been battling with and dealing with a little bit, God has used Pat to minister to me. Unbelievable. Amen. Do not tell me there is no God and there is no idea of what in the world is going on. God knows what you and I need when Amen. we need it. Okay? He knows it. He's always got our back covered. As I begin to land this, I feel so led to share this, and I'm going to get quickly to the rest of my testimony. About five, six years ago, I'm going through something. My younger sister's diagnosed with breast cancer. I was dealing with an issue with a neighbor. Some of you might have heard this, many of you haven't heard this story. The man who used to speak vitally into my life before he passed on and left his ambassador ministries to his son, his name was Moses. The first time he came to my house, my younger son said, Dad, is that the same guy from the Bible with the big stick and the dress on That's what he asked. He said, no, he doesn't have a dress. He might have a big stick, but he has no dress. Well, long story short, on Martin Luther King Day of that particular year, I get an email from him late at night, which I didn't read because he lived in California. I read it first thing that morning. He said, Bobby, you've really been on my heart. I've been praying for you. He said, I want you to read Joshua 1, verses 5 to 9. I go to Joshua 1, verses 5 to 9, and when I get to verse 9, he jumps off the page at me. And it says, fear not. In case you don't know, fear not is 365 times in the Bible. Be strong and courageous. The Lord is with you everywhere you go. Yes, Lord. Awesome. I needed to hear that. Thank you for the confidence and the encouragement from Moses. Later that morning, early afternoon, my wife, at the time I was living in Seminole, Florida, my wife is leaving 
to take my younger son to the French department store Target. I mean Target, I'm sorry. Take him to Target. She's going to take my son Alan to Target. He's going to buy a few things. Hey, listen, better go to Target than Walmart, because I always say this all the time. When parents want to spank and punish their children, for some reason, they always bring them to Walmart. Because I always watch kids running for their lives at Walmart, trust me. Because I can deal with Walmart and spanking your children. Well, anyway. So I said, do me a favor, drop me off at Madeira Beach, and I'll walk all the way back. It's about five miles. I'll take some time. I'll meditate. I'll pray. I'll walk on the beach, talk to some friends on the phone. Hey, this is why we live in Florida. On January 18th, it's 74 degrees. Yeah. Well, I'm walking on the beach, and all of a sudden, as I'm walking, I notice a man in the distance. Long hair, no shirt on, pair of jeans, short, <laughs> staring out over the Gulf of Mexico. I'm drawn to him, but I continually walk closer and closer. The closer I get... He starts to turn just a little bit as I'm walking on the beach, and I notice, I'm thinking, what a great opportunity to go talk to him. He's got on his left chest muscle, pictorial muscle, this amazing tattoo. It's a tattoo that should be framed and hung on the wall. It's a beautiful picture of a lion leaning back on his back paws, his front paws are in front of him, the mane is blowing in the wind. It's an amazing work of art in this tattoo form on his chest. So I figured, let me walk up to him and start talking to him. So I start to walk towards him. He turns a little more towards the center. And as he turns more towards facing me head on, my jaw drops. I can't believe what I see. I run up to this man and I grab him and I start to shake him. And I go, do you believe in God? Do you believe in faith? Do you have faith? And he goes, yeah, yeah, let go of me, let go of me, let go of me. <laughs> let me tell you something. You never tell me there is no God center of his chest, next to the line are tattooed the words, be strong and courageous, Joshua 1, 9. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? So I talk to him. He lives in Cleveland, Ohio. He's staying a mile, uh, excuse me, more than a mile. He was staying an hour north past Newport Richie. I said, what made you come to this area near a beach? He says, well, when I was married, before my wife left me, this is where we used to come to the beach all the time. He said, I had to get away from my friends. They were driving me nuts. Number two, I said, what's the Joshua 1-9 from? He said, I said, in reality, my brother had been battling cancer. That's his favorite scripture, so I wear it for him. And I'm like, God, we know what we need when we need it. Amen. Do we have that picture, brother? Amen. Awesome. If you can put this picture up, I want to close with this. Because this is vital, what I'm about to share. Okay. This past August... I had the privilege of going back to Texas and doing some work and seeing some of my former students from the school that I was at when I went through the tragedy I did. I had the privilege of going back to the house where 30 years ago my wife was tragically killed. If you can look at the house, they rebuilt the wall and you can see the difference of the brick. That's literally where the truck crashed to my house. And I got to tell you what I did that day. The Spirit of God moved on me, and I dropped to my knees right outside the house. And here's what I said. I said, Father God, your Spirit is leading me in this, and I want to pray this prayer. I said, if there is anything from this tragedy 30 years later that I am still holding on to, that I have never released and put on the cross where you took it, or I went to the cross and pulled it off the cross and tried to carry it myself, once and for all, I am taking this, and I am nailing it back to the cross, Amen. where it belongs, where you told me it is finished. And where you told me how much I mattered as you stretched out your arms for me. And I knelt there crying and weeping, and the Spirit of God was so real. And he gave me revelation to say there are too many people on this earth that are going through this earth that everything that Christ has carried for you on the cross our humanness, our flesh, trust me, I am no different than anybody in this room. I try to take it off and I try to carry it myself. And I try to work it out myself without relying on the power of the Holy Spirit. Gentlemen, today is Saturday, on Thursday. I stood in front of 400 amazing young women at the Academy of the Holy Names in Tampa, Florida. And I poured my heart into 400 high school students. And as I shared my testimony and as I shared my story, I watched girl after girl just weeping and sobbing and crying. And these young ladies would run up to me and they stick their arms in my face and say, I've told nobody about this, but I've been a cutter because of the pain that life has been telling me. One girl comes up to me and says, my father was murdered two years ago, but you're the first person that told me how much I mattered. Thank you. 
that God could give me the strength. And of course, in a school like the Academy of the Holy Name, to have more privilege of sharing greater faith issues than I can in public schools. But I gotta tell you, when I go into the public schools of America, my heart breaks because people are broken. People are broken from every background. The enemy's greatest goal is to break people. And people are broken and they're desperately looking. And some of you heard me share this, but I gotta tell you, one of my favorite songs of all time is from a rock band from the 70s and 80s. Their name is Foreigner. And Foreigner's song was, I want to know what love is, I want you to show me. We have a world that is screaming out to the church. I want to know what love is, I, I want you to show me. We have a church, we have the body of Christ that still is hungry and desperate, screaming out, God. I want to know what love is. I want you to show me. Because for whatever has been packaged and presented to me, I don't understand. Remember this, gentlemen. If me or any of the other speakers, which will all have amazing testimonies and stories to share with you this morning, if we try to talk you into something, somebody can talk you out of it. Mm -hmm. But if the Holy Spirit transforms your heart, there is yes, nobody to talk you Yes, about. that's right. It happens. Man. There's nobody changing your mind when the Holy Spirit transforms. That's right. That's Hear right. me, gentlemen. This is no manipulation. This is nothing on me trying to manipulate you and get you to do something because I want to be able to say, wow, <laughs> look what I got to do. Absolutely. That has nothing to do with me, and I'm telling you straight out. It doesn't. My heart is greater than ever to see the broken heart healed, to see the captive set free. To see the eyes of the blind physically and spiritually to be opened. In Jesus' name. Yeah, so fellas, I'm going to ask you to do something simple with me. Because I feel very strong to have done this. This is the house I knelt in front of where my life was changed within one moment 30 years ago. If you have anything in your life, okay, anything, and I'll be the first one to stand right here. If you have anything in your life that still needs to be brought to the cross and put back on the cross because you've been trying to take it off the cross, okay, in your flesh realm, or you have any other form of unforgiveness for yourself, you know what happens when we don't forgive ourselves? We, we as human beings, cheapen the blood of Jesus Christ. We say your blood's worthless because I feel I'm worthless. Or when we don't forgive others, we're saying his blood is not great enough to cover everything that that person has done wrong against us. So gentlemen, I'm going to ask you as we start off this day, and as you go through this day, if you have anything in your life that you've still been trying to carry around yourself, you've never opened up your heart to Jesus Christ, or you have any form of unforgiveness, please do me a favor just for this moment. I'm going to ask you to please stand up with me right now. Just stand up. Don't worry about nobody else. This is about you and God the Father. I'm just going to ask you to stand right where you're at. For every one of you who stood, I'm going to ask you to do number two. Please come right up and stand with me right here. I'm going to stand with you. I'm with you. Okay? Anybody that has anything, just come on up right now. I appreciate it. Thank you, gentlemen. Number three. For every one of you that are sitting down, I'm going to ask you, if you are a believer, these are your brothers in Jesus Christ. And you need to let them know, as the Word of God says, we are here to carry one another's burdens. I'm going to ask you to get up and fill in right behind them to let them know that they are not alone, that this prayer that's going to be prayed is in full agreement with every single person that is here today, whether those who have issues or those who don't have issues. I'm going to ask you guys to place... One hand, one of your hands, on somebody's shoulder. Take your other hand and hold it up in the air. And here's what we're going to do. And just please simply repeat this prayer with me, and I'm going to pray with you. Father God, Father God thank, you thank you for sending Jesus on my behalf. Thank you when he spread his arms on the cross. He screamed out to me, you matter. That's why I'm doing this for you. Jesus, when you said the words, it is finished. It is 100% done. Your blood was shed on my behalf. 
for every sin, for every wrongdoing, and for the power of forgiveness that I could operate in my life. Father, I put back on the cross anything that I have taken off and that I've tried to carry myself. In the name of Jesus Christ, thank you that I have the Holy Spirit alive inside of me that screams out daily, you matter. And that he's given me the ability to be and do all that God's called me to be and do. Thank you, Jesus, for loving me, for being there for me, and knowing that I can count on your Holy Spirit no matter what. And Father, thank you for sending your angels to surround me and to work on my behalf. I decree with thanksgiving that your angels go before me, helping to prepare a way for me to be led by your spirit to fulfill your perfect will in my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, give the Lord a big hand, Todd, will you? Awesome gentlemen. Awesome gentlemen. Awesome gentlemen. I just want to...